Thank you. Now, I'm just going to go slightly against the grain and put up an introductory slide, uh, which we're not supposed to do, of course, uh, and just say all the things that Steve just said about me. So there you go. Uh, I'm from Sydney University, PhD student studying the evolution of galaxies. And one of the problems we have when looking out into the sky and mapping the sky is that we have to look out from inside the Milky Way. And when you're looking near the plane of the Milky Way, you can see here that you get a thing called confusion, where stars are start to overlap each other because there are so many stars to look through. But this is not the only problem with looking through out of the galaxy. You also have dust and gas. And in the next slide, you have dust and gas in optical uh, wavelength light here, and then below in infrared light. And you can see that the infrared light gets absorbed a lot less than the uh, optical light does, and so you get a much clearer picture of the center of the Milky Way, or wherever else you happen to be looking. Now, this is the entire sky, believe it or not, and this is 41,000 about square degrees of sky. And unfortunately, most telescopes have some small fraction of one square degree as their field of view. So field of view is extremely important if you're trying to look at huge chunks of the sky, like I normally do. And this gives you an idea of how important aperture is. Bigger is always better. I'm sorry, everyone. Bigger really is always better. We have a small aperture here. We have five times larger aperture there. And you can see the difference in resolution is absolutely unbelievable. Now, the, the same idea here, if you use a telescope on the left-hand side here, has 11 times the size a mirror that the um, telescope on the right does, which turns a seven-night observing run for these galaxies here into a 77-night observing run, which is clearly not very much fun. Now, actually, I was lying, bigger is not always better. Okay, so because the larger the telescope you have, the smaller the field of view generally is, which is not ideal, obviously. And so, and that is unless, of course, you use some kind of optical trickery like this thing called 2DF, which stands for two degree field. It gives you two square degree field on the largest optical telescope in Australia called the KAT. Now, it's not a very easy thing to do. This was the first instrument of its type built in the world, built in 1994. And the reason it was the first one built is because this is exactly what you have to do. You've got to get a huge amount of objects, you've got to stick them all together in exactly the right way, four different correct plates, exactly the right focal length, etc., etc. And this eventually gives you this two degree field of view, but this took a lot, a lot of time for the research to get to do. Now, these kinds of advancements in optics and also in detectors has led to a, a large scale survey that started in 1950 with the DSS survey, although that was never actually intended to be an all sky survey, it just turned out that way. They used these two telescopes, that would be the next slide, to map. Uh, with these are telescopes from opposite sides of the world, so they can map the entire sky. They took 52 years of images from both these telescopes, digitized the entire thing, and had the first entire sky survey. And they obviously did it through the 70s, looking at these guys here. Now, the first infrared survey, this was it here in 1969, this covered 70% of the sky. We've got about 5,500 infrared sources. And, uh, but, and since then, there's been a 100 million time improvement in detector sensitivity, which has led us to this next slide, which is the two micron orbit sky survey covering the entire sky. One half of one billion stars and three million galaxies, which you can see all in the background there, all uh, color coded by redshift, which you can ask me about over a beer at the bar later if you'd like to. And now this slow visual sky survey, this is covering a quarter of the sky in the northern hemisphere, and uh, it's almost finished, it was finished in 2014, and then uh, once this is finished, they've just put in a telescope into a, uh, uh, an observatory near in North, sorry, in New South Wales called Siding Spring, with the most imaginative name for a telescope you can imagine. And this is actually a picture at the top here. It's actually from their website, believe it or not. It looks like a little bit of a kid's drawing to me. But it was delivered just late last year and will start up observations sometime early this year. And it will be, yeah, it'll be at the SES in the south. Now, the problem with all these telescopes is that the aperture is quite small. And what you can see is the distance cutoffs in these surveys is basically because of the aperture size. You can't look far enough out into the universe because the aperture of the telescope is small. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the future of large aperture telescopes, starting with the giant Magellan telescope, which has four. Uh, eight point, sorry, seven, and Captain Head yourself, seven, eight point seven meters in Arabic mirrors, uh, the first of which has already been built, that's as far as I've got. The next is the European Extremely Large Telescope, believe it or not, that's the name of the thing. <laughs> and this thing will be, once it's actually completed at the cost of about three quarters of a billion euro, it'll be as tall as the Eiffel Tower, the dome that houses it, with a 42 meter aperture. This thing will be built apparently by about 2020, hopefully. This though is my favourite telescope concept ever, the overwhelmingly large telescope. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, that's really what it's called. And if the one and a half billion dollar budget has to be shrunk a little bit for the so the telescope shrinks a bit, it'll be the originally was larger telescope. Now, unfortunately, though, no matter where you are, how good your telescope is, how good your instrumentation is, sometimes you're in the hand of the world. So thank you very much.